Please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. So we've reached the start of a new year. We're also reaching the start of a new chapter in the Sermon on the Mount. That was not deliberate. It just worked out that way. But we do need to remember that Jesus did not write a book neatly divided into chapters. He did not give a series of pithy, unrelated statements that were then indexed into a book. Jesus preached a sermon. And while chapter 6, I think the chapter break is at the right point, there is a change in, in theme or direction. It still builds upon everything that has come before it in the sermon, and it builds towards everything that follows in chapter 7. And, and so to best understand the 6th chapter... We're going to read the sermon from its beginning in Matthew chapter 5 uh, through chapter 6, verse 21. But before we do that, let's pray together. O oh Lord, how many are our foes? We can so easily point to our foes outside of us, politicians who hate the gospel and hate the truth, nations that hate your church and your people. Lord, how many are our foes within us? The sin that dwells in us, the lies that fill our minds, the false desires that captivate our hearts, all working together to pull us away from you, to pull us towards death. These foes insist to us that there is no salvation in our God. But Lord, you are a shield around us. You alone are our glory. You alone are the lifter of our heads. So Lord, as we cry to you, keep us from setting our hope on any other. No politician can save us, for you are our king. No public personality can persuade the nations and deliver us. You alone sent your Son as the prophet. Lord, you alone will sustain us. And you are greater than all who are in the world. Lord, let us not be afraid of even thousands of people who have set themselves against us. Truly, they set themselves against you. Arise, O Lord, and save us, our God. Salvation belongs to you and to none other. Draw us to you with cords of kindness. Secure us with your bonds of love. May we walk bravely in your truth. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, You fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. It was also said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? 
Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do, in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of our Lord. So Jesus began this sermon by telling people what righteousness was. What the character of a person acceptable to God looks like. Poor in spirit mournful, meek, hungering for righteousness, observing and, and teaching the law, merciful, pure, peacemaking, enduring persecution, avoiding even the, the heart set on murder and adultery and dishonesty and self-centeredness, and, and cutting off all temptations to sin. Indeed, righteousness is to be perfect. But this standard of perfection is so high, it's so unobtainable that, that we despair of, of reaching it. Maybe, maybe we can have a, a perfect score on a test or an assignment. Maybe we can have a perfect game in baseball or in bowling. But a perfect life? A morally perfect life? We can't do it. And so the temptation is to give up on being perfect and rather commit ourselves to looking perfect. How else can my righteousness exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees? I can hide my sin from my neighbors and I can present a righteous exterior to the church. I can make myself look good. But Jesus says... No, that, that's not it. 
the, the major shift from chapters 5 to 6 is, is a shift from the character of righteousness. That's chapter 5. This is what righteousness is. And now he's talking about the, the orientation of righteousness here. Righteousness is not oriented towards our neighbors or our family or our friends or, or even ourselves. Righteousness is oriented towards God. And, and so our verse this morning, Matthew 6, 1, is a warning from Jesus to make sure that we understand what our righteousness needs to be. He says, again, Beware of practicing your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. And then he goes on to speak about giving to the needy in secret, and about praying in secret, and about fasting in secret. He talks about laying up treasures in heaven, not on earth. And what he's teaching us to do is to practice righteousness, not to be seen by man, but to be seen by God. And he starts with this, this warning phrase, this, this attention-grabbing word, beware. Beware. He's, he's telling us that it takes conscious, deliberate effort to practice righteousness towards God instead of man. In, in the King James, it, it reads, take heed. Or the NIV says, be careful. We could say, pay attention to this. Make sure that you're doing this. We, we do all sorts of things mindlessly in life. And usually that's okay. If you drive the same route to work every day, you don't have to pay strict attention to every turn that you're making. You, you know when you get to your turn and you turn there. Um, on, on my commute to my job, uh, there's a long stretch of highway with one stop sign on it. And I, I always stop there, but very often I find myself past the stop sign and I have no conscious recollection of slowing down and braking. And I drive a manual, so I have to shift gears and shift gears again. And I just, it all happens automatically. And, and I'm down the road, and well, I guess I must have stopped. I, I, I do stop. I don't run through the stop sign. But I don't think about it. I just do it. Or you, you give directions to someplace that, that you drive all the time to get to your house. And I mean, you do it multiple times. Then you think about explaining it to somebody else. Well, you just turn there. But, but where is there? You know, but you don't think about it anymore. You, you just do it. We, we lock our doors, we return greetings, we do all sorts of things without really thinking about what we're doing. I, I find myself at the gym on occasion, um, somebody will say, you know, enjoy your workout. And I'm so used to somebody just saying, have a nice day, and, well, you too, they're not, they're not working out because they're working at the desk, but you just, you say it, it's, it's, it's mindless, it's automatic. We're reserving our brain power for more important, more demanding tasks. But we can't do that with righteousness. We have to pay attention. We have to be aware. We have to take heed to make sure that we're practicing righteousness rightly. Because otherwise, we, we will fall into this trap. It's so easy for people who accept the words of Christ as true to still fall into the trap of practicing righteousness before other people, for the benefit of other people. And if you doubt that, just consider how much easier it is for you to sin when you're by yourself than when you're next to another member of the church. How much easier it is to sin by yourself than when your parents are sitting with you. It's, so often we, we care more, we're concerned more with the opinions of the people around us than we are with the approval of God. If we cared more about the approval of God, then it wouldn't make a difference to us if other people were around us or not. Because God sees all. And 
And so what, what we need to understand, what we need to be aware of, is that I don't need to impress anyone with my meekness. I need to actually be meek. I don't need to impress anyone else with my peacefulness. I need to actually be a peacemaker. I don't need to impress anyone else with my devotion to God. I need to be truly devoted to God. It, it's easy to make ourselves look good, to do the right things externally on the occasions when we know other people are watching. But it's another thing entirely to be truly righteous and truly devoted to God. Consider the fifth chapter of the prophet Amos. He prophesied during the reigns of Uzziah and Jeroboam. And during that time, the people of Judah and Israel remained very religious. Now, Israel's worship was deficient from the beginning of their separation from Judah. They, they set up golden calves to prevent people from going to Jerusalem to worship there. And, and Israel was always a mess. But the worship of Judah remained outwardly Orthodox. They worshipped at the temple. They kept the appointed feasts. They offered the appointed sacrifices. They sang songs of praise. But what did God have to say about it all? Amos 5.21 and following, he says, I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. I will not accept your offerings. Take away the noise of your songs. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Without righteousness and justice, without true righteousness and true justice, then all their outward religious activity is, is meaningless and worse than meaningless. It's an active insult to God and he hates it. And we could list man after man in, in recent years who appeared for a time at least to be righteous for our eyes. Pastor after pastor, minister after minister. It was staggering and painful to, to sit down and, and really think about the number of names that could be come up with. And we only hear about the prominent people, the famous people who are guilty of this. Their righteousness is only external. It's practiced before others in order to be seen by others, to be praised by others, to be respected by others, and in order to benefit from others. But time and again, their sins found them out. And unless they, they repent of their sin and their unrighteousness, then they will suffer the wrath of God forever. And their outward righteousness will do them absolutely no benefit at all. They've already received their reward. They've gotten the praise of men, the admiration of men for their appearance of righteousness. But God knows the truth. And there, there are others who, who have or who will remain outwardly righteous to the end of their lives. And, and their sin might never be revealed to the rest of us. But they will still find themselves damned to the lake of fire because they were not righteous before God. Hebrews 4.13 reminds us that God sees everything. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed before the eyes of him to whom they must give account. And so these outwardly righteous men and women will have no reward from our Father who is in heaven. Their only reward is from the people that they have impressed with their false righteousness. Rather, we 
must strive to be righteous before God with, with no concern for the regard of the world. And Jesus gives us three very clear examples about this in, in the sermon. Again, in, in giving, in praying, and in fasting. We'll talk about each of them in detail in, in future weeks, if the Lord wills. But his point in each example is the same. These are righteous things. You should be doing them. Do them discreetly. Do them privately. Even do them secretly. Don't give so that people know that you're giving. Don't insist that, that your name be in the news for the generous contribution that you give. That your name be on the side of the building that you helped pay for. Give because it's right to give. Don't pray so that people know that you're praying. And don't heap up high and lofty and repeated words so that everyone's impressed with how well you pray. Pray simply and pray privately. Pray because it's right to do so. And don't fast so that people know that you're fasting. Don't make a spectacle of yourself and disfigure your face and make everyone know how wretched and miserable you are and how painful this experience is. But you're so committed to God that you're going to do it anyway. Shouldn't you admire how committed I am? Fast when you're compelled to fast because it's the right thing to do in your circumstance. And, and while you're fasting, anoint your head and wash your face. And don't make a point of your fasting to the people around you. You're not fasting for them. You're not praying for them. You're not giving for them. You're, you're practicing these things so that your Father may see. So that our Father may reward us. The, the exact same two sentences appear in all three of Jesus' examples here. It says, first, <clears throat> truly I say to you, they have received their reward. In verse 2, in verse, um, verse 2, verse 5, and verse 16, truly I say to you, they have received their reward. They, they did this to be seen by people. They got seen by people. They received whatever praise or recognition they're going to receive by people. And that's all that they're going to get from it. They will have no reward from your Father who's in heaven. He contrasts that with those who do these righteous works secretly. In verses 4, 6, and 18, Jesus makes the same promise. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So this, this public religiosity, this, this outward righteousness, does not result in heavenly rewards. Jesus says to do these things in secret. But this doesn't mean that we need to conceal the fact that we believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean we're to be secret Christians hiding our faith from the world. We, we can't be ashamed of Jesus. But what he's telling us is that we should never do anything to draw attention to ourselves. We should never do anything with the intention of being seen by others. We should never do anything righteous in order to be seen by them. Rather, as Jesus said it in Matthew 5, 16, we let our light shine before others so that they may see our good deeds and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Whenever our good deeds become known, people should give glory to God alone, not to us. 
So we need to learn to be content with being unknown and unrecognized and unpraised. Our Father sees in secret. And this can be costly in earthly terms. It can lead to a loss of opportunity, perhaps. It can lead to a loss of praise from men and whatever earthly benefits they can provide to us. People have gotten rich out of being outwardly righteous. But there's a reward from God that comes to those who do their righteousness in secret. A reward that far surpasses everything in this world. I think the clearest description of that reward is found in Romans chapter 2, verses 6 and following. Paul writes, God will render, God will give, to each one according to his works. To those who, by patience and well-doing, seek for glory and honor and immortality... He will give eternal life. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. So what, what's the reward? The, the reward for doing good, the reward for patience and well-doing, the reward for righteousness is eternal life, glory and honor and peace. These are the rewards of the righteous. And the world can offer you only this, this pale, poor, feeble imitation of what God offers with, with all the world's blessings and all the world's protections, everything the world can offer you, you might live a little over a hundred years in this world. But God offers life that never ends. With, with all the world's favor, you, you might receive, in, in Paul's day, the Olympic champions won a, a crown of laurels. Right? And it would wither and die inside of a month. Now, you know, maybe they'll give you a gold medal. Um, and that medal might last for the rest of your life. For all the good, it will do you. They, they can give you medals. They can give you titles. That they can give you little golden statues for whatever good they do you. But God offers an imperishable crown of glory that far surpasses and far outlasts all that the world has. You can receive honor from the people of the world, but, but what is the honor of men compared to the honor of God? All of humanity's honor is flawed and fallen and, and fragile, but God's honor is, is perfect. And, and the world can offer you, can say it can offer you peace, on its terms. They, they can stop trying to do violence against you. But the world's peace is a fickle thing. It, it's balanced on a razor's edge. And, and the slightest change in circumstance, the slightest change in attitude, can, can tip that peace off into the abyss. But God's peace is certain and secure and eternal. And there's no change in God that can threaten that peace. Ultimately, the reward that God offers is Himself. It's all of Him. All of His goodness, all of His beauty, all of His glory, all of His truth, all of His blessings and honor and joy and pleasure. He gives Himself as your Father as your friend, your defender, your deliverer. He gives himself as your Lord. It's a privilege to you, not to him. Have people such as yourselves as his subjects. 
He gives in Himself all good things. And He gives Himself as a reward for those whose righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, those who patiently and persistently do good, those who are perfect, even as He is perfect. And this brings us flush up against the problem again. Maybe, maybe, I can manage to look good and righteous before others. Especially if I'm largely isolated from them. If you only see me for a couple hours on Sundays. If you only see me in carefully scripted appearances. Then I can make myself look good and appear righteous. The more known you are, the harder it becomes to appear righteous before others. But even if you can appear righteous before everyone else, God sees in secret. God sees even the innermost longings of the heart. God sees into the deepest, darkest recesses of your mind. God knows the absolute truth about me. And he knows the absolute truth about you. And that truth is we, we are not perfect. We're not even as righteous as the scribes and the Pharisees. We don't deserve any reward from God. We deserve His wrath and His fury. And that is why we are Christians, not moralists. This is why we preach Christ, not good works, or personal righteousness. We cannot do good enough. We cannot be good enough to merit God's rewards. But there's one who is good enough. One who has done enough to merit eternal life. To merit honor and glory and peace. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He took on flesh and dwelt among us. He became like us in every respect, yet without sin. And his perfect life secured for himself all the rewards of the Father. And his death and resurrection secured those same rewards for everyone who would trust in him. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he can take away your sin as well. And clothe you in his righteousness. And when you are covered in the righteousness of Christ. You will receive all the blessings. All the rewards of God. Not because of what you have earned. But because of what Jesus has earned for you. And the, the danger with this. The, the truth can always be twisted by unrighteous people. Jude warns about those who pervert the grace of God in his sensuality. Right, Paul had to defend himself in his gospel message from, from charges of being both a legalist and of being in called antinomians now um, against the law. Right, he was accused of overthrowing the law by this grace. He had to insist, by no means, on the contrary, we uphold the law. People charge, well, if your gospel's true, why not continue in sin that grace may abound? And then he'd have to respond, by no means. The fact that our reward comes through Christ's righteousness does not mean that we, as Christians, can simply neglect personal righteousness. But it means we don't depend upon our personal righteousness. We depend upon Christ. As we walk in obedience to Him, as we gaze upon His face, as we rest in His righteousness, we become like Him. Romans 8 tells us that we are predestined. Those who God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. We become like Christ. 
we begin to practice and pursue righteousness, not because we, we have to do this thing that we find distasteful. One of our cats has been having some health issues and, and we have this liquid painkiller we're supposed to be giving it and the cat doesn't like it. And, and so we have to you know, force his mouth open and stick the syringe down his throat. And it, he's a very easygoing cat, but it's not easy to do that. But we need to do it because he, he needs the medicine to, to get better. Right? And, and we're all like that with medicine, with health food, with exercise, if we exercise. So I, I don't like doing this, but I have to do it. That should not be our relationship with righteousness. We begin to practice and pursue righteousness because we want to be righteous. Because our nature is being changed. Because we, we cannot do otherwise. No one needs to be convinced of the value of breathing. I don't have to persuade you. You need to breathe 8 to 16 times a minute. I did look up that number this morning. We do it. We breathe. We have to breathe. We can try to stop breathing, but then we're going to be compelled to breathe. Right? And now, that doesn't mean there's not room for, for, you know, here, you can breathe better this way. Breathe through your nose, not through your mouth. And, and, but we're going to breathe. Right? And as Christians, indwelled by the Holy Spirit, conformed, and being conformed to the image of Christ, being led by the Word of God, we're going to practice righteousness because it's become a part of our new nature. It's being renewed day by day. And we'll continue to grow in that righteousness throughout our lives until we reach perfection in the arms of Christ. We pursue righteousness. We practice righteousness. But we don't depend upon righteousness. We depend upon Christ. I hope, I hope that you recognize your own unrighteousness. I hope that you recognize your hopelessness in attaining your own righteousness. If, if you don't think you're hopeless, then, then what I would ask you to do is to take these words of Jesus seriously here in the Sermon on the Mount. And do your best to be perfect. To do everything he's telling us to do in these words. And try it. Seriously try it. And once you've tried it, and you've realized that you can't do it. If, if you can do it, if you can sinlessly obey Christ's word, then, then you don't need Christ as your mediator. And you can earn your own way into heaven. But when you find that you can't do it, then turn to Christ for His grace. The answer isn't to grit your teeth and try harder to be good. The answer is to look to Christ, to trust in Christ, to depend upon Christ. He is the righteous one. He will cover you with His righteousness. And he will give you the reward of the righteous. Trust in him. Will you pray with me? Lord, your word declares that praise befits the upright. How can we cease from singing your praise? 
you who have delivered us from wrath, from death, from hell. Your words are upright, and all your work is faithful. You love righteousness and justice, and you make us righteous and just. You have filled us with your steadfast love and you surround us with your steadfast love. We are blessed to be your people. To know that your counsels will stand through all generations. No king is saved by his great army. No warrior is delivered by his great strength. The great might of the war horse cannot rescue. But your eye is on those who fear you, on those who hope in your steadfast love. You will deliver our souls from death. You will keep us alive in every trial of life. And so, Lord, our souls wait for you. Our heart is glad in you because we trust in your holy name. May your steadfast love be upon us even as we hope in you. Save us, O oh Lord, as you have covenanted to do before the world began. We ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.